Um, thank you so, so much, everybody, for coming. And um, it's a huge honor for me to announce uh, Alvin Wengueling and his uh, keynote today uh, on the Engage platform. Um, anything else to say, Alvin? I'm going to hand over to you. Are you ready? Um, sounds good. We're uh, good to go. Excellent. Here we go. All right. Hey, hey, thank, hey. thanks, uh, thanks, Daniel, and uh, absolutely. Th thank you, Daniel and Chris and Laurel for for all you guys have been doing to really put this event together. I think this is just an amazing start. I mean, to get this scale of a conference together, it's uh, I know it's so much work, and just even between our sessions, we've been doing a lot of rehearsals and practices and to to make this all work. So thank you for all the hard work that you're doing. In fact, I, I think what you're doing here is actually going to be the beginning of a new trend for how conferences and events are going to be held in the near future. Probably, you know, much faster than a lot of people think. In fact, you know, this week was supposed to be MWC in Barcelona, as a lot of you guys know, but it was canceled uh, because of the coronavirus. So, uh, you know, with more and more health scares, more and more concerns about climate, I think events like this is uh, definitely in the right direction to allow things to happen. In fact, in China, pretty much every single conference in China uh, this month and probably for the next two months have been canceled. So uh, the only way we can actually still hold conferences is actually in platforms like this. So, uh, you know, good you to, to make this happen. Thanks, thanks again, uh, you know, all the organizers and volunteers. Um, so today, I, I guess I wanted to to chat, you know, really more from a, a higher level view. I think, you know, this morning, uh, you know, we had uh, Tom who really talked more about the history and some of the technology behind uh, VR, but I, I really wanted to give you some on the ground uh, experiences and case studies and, and research that we've been doing to highlight the benefits of this technology uh, for, for learning. And you, know, you guys are all actually already uh, VR experts, so I, I don't need to give you any of the, the basic information. Um, so actually, before I, before I, uh, before I start, I wanted to uh, show you, if I was there in person, I would actually be wearing this to uh, to do to my speech with you. So I wanted to uh, do this picture for Chris because he, he specifically <laughs> gave me this mask. <laughs> Thanks, Chris. <laughs> um, but, you know, given given that I'm in virtual, we don't have to do uh, worry anything about face mask. Um, so as, as you can see in the picture behind me, we, we have essentially a picture of, of class going on a field trip. Right. I, I think at the end of the day, that's the value kind of summed in one, one picture of what VR can do for schools. Uh, I don't know, I mean, how many of you guys remember back in elementary school or kindergarten, you know, the thing that you look forward to every year was the field trip, was the thing when you actually left the classroom and went out in the real world and saw things and touched things and you really felt it live. I mean, what VR can do for education is that it turns every single class into a field trip. It makes everybody excited about what they're doing and makes school something that's something to look forward to. Right? I think that in, in a nutshell is why VR works, why VR helps education. Right? Uh, I'll actually go back and give you some more, some more data on this. But I also wanna highlight that I think all the things that what you guys are doing as a group is really impactful because what separates people from all other animals, from humans from other is our ability to learn. So if we can help ourselves learn better, if we can help more people be more educated, we're essentially enabling a generation of people to, to really do a lot more than they ever have, to be able to accomplish more as a generation. So, you know, the, the, the work that you guys are doing to enable VR education on a broad basis is going to change the future of our, our species. So thank you all before I, I get it. Um, so, you know, I, I'm a person who really believes in education. Uh, why? Let's go back to the beginning. So this this is me um, on a re-education farm during the cultural revolution. So both of my parents were educators. Uh, they met like farmers here. 
but they were actually, uh, one is a, a founder of the, the Shanghai Ballet School and the Guangzhou Ballet School, my mom. And my dad was a professor of art uh, at the uh, Guangzhou uh, Academy of Fine Arts for years. So I grew up around education and I grew up around you know, how to teach and, and the value of teaching. But I was born uh, on a farm and my first two years lived uh, in a chicken shed, actually was a chicken shed transformed into our our uh, room during the time we were being re-educated. And my brother is uh, next to me. So I was very fortunate that my parents uh, in 1980 uh, was given the ability to, to immigrate uh, to the, the U.S. And the reason they, they, they motivated them was that they wanted to give my brother and I a better education. That was the, the primary reason why they went through all the effort to immigrate. And they told us that when this is the day I landed in the Hawaii airport, uh, my first day in the United States. And my dad said to me, you know, we're, we're coming here to give you guys a better life, to give you guys a better education, you know, make value of it. And, uh, you know, we have no money. We were just artists and, and you know, teachers. So if you want to go to a good college, you need to work hard and you need to study hard and get scholarships because we can't afford to, to pay for your school. Uh, luckily, you know, 20 years from that day, pretty much, my brother and I both uh, graduated with double masters from MIT, uh, one of the better schools in the world, and we did it on scholarship. So, so we were able to, to essentially fulfill what my parents wanted us to do when they came to the United States to give us the opportunity. I think a lot of what has happened, why I'm, I'm on the stage in front of you guys today, is because of my access to that education, to the, to the whole U.S. education system, and you know the, the luck of having been able to immigrate. Now, I think one of the things that will be most valuable for what you guys are doing is that you will be able to bring that high quality education that a uh, very few people get to have and make it available to anybody in the world through VR. Right? Anybody who can afford a few hundred dollars headset can be in VR and be able to be educated by the best teachers in the world, the Nobel Prize winners in the world. I think that's the, the value of what we as a industry is able to provide. So there's three people I, I do need to thank to make, you know, for, for, for why I'm here. Um, one is my dad, of course. So in 1980, uh, he gave me that purpose. He sat me down, sat my brother down and said, you guys are here to make the most out of yourself. You guys need to contribute to society. You guys need to give back because you're lucky to come to this country, right? And I never forgot that. Right. I, 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 he kept saying, you know, you, artists, because you guys don't have art genes or you have art genes, but you don't know, you don't have art funds. So go do something that's right for you, <laughs> that you can make the most of them. And so I, I've been looking, you know, th throughout my childhood for what could be that impact. And I, I really love technologies. Pretty much since I, uh, about the first year I landed, I started playing with computers and, and really started programming when I was nine and, you know, really got into it. And that's, that's kind of what drove me. Now, you know, about 10, 11 years from then, I was able to meet uh, Dr. Tom Furness. So I was uh, one of his uh, students at the HIT lab at the university he spoke this morning, and he's one of the, essentially the grandfather of VR. He's kind of the guy who helped put this industry in motion. Uh, and the funny enough, my, my research paper with him was, uh, Applying the VR to education, to disrupting education. So think about that, right? So now, almost 30 years after that, <laughs> I'm actually applying the things that I had studied with him on. I, I remember the, the, the result of that paper actually said, within 10 years, everybody will be using VR to educate and it's going to change the world. Uh, I was wrong. <laughs> so um, 20, years, 20 years late, but I think... I think uh, you know we're 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 very close to that right now, and then, you know in the next few slides, I think you'll you'll you know probably start to agree that we're definitely on the right direction. And then, <clears throat> lastly, I want to make sure to uh, share Wang, who's the chairman of uh, HCC. In 2000, we met. In 2016, I joined HCC. 
to essentially help fulfill that mission. Because when we talk, what really connected me with her that she really believed in education, she really believed in giving back, and she really believed that VR was a vehicle to do that. And because of our shared vision was why I, I joined HTC. So, you know, I think we're, we're as a people right now, we are the luckiest generation ever. We get to have all of these technologies, all of these things as part of our daily life. And, these things have changed. These technologies have changed us so much in just the last few years. In the next 10 years, uh, a lot of pundits are saying essentially the world will change in more in the next 10 years than it has in the last 100, right? And we know how much has changed in the last 100. So with these technologies that are hands and feet, we're going to be able to accomplish so much more. I think, so that's something that we need to think about is how do you apply not just VR, but AI and high and speed connectivity and robotics and you know other things to really enable a, a new generation of humans. We can turn everybody into a superhuman. Now, of course, with all these technologies, it's also giving us a lot more challenges. I'll go through a little bit of that later in the presentation. But you know, I, I think the opportunity is definitely greater than the challenges. And we need to start moving and working and living at a slightly different, faster pace to keep up with the pace of change that technology is bringing on this world. So you know, here's a picture of a, a person you know, kind of a rendering of a person who, you know, in the next few years will probably be living and learning this way, looking at shapes and looking at objects and learning about concepts visually and being able to, to have an immersive experience. You know, this person doesn't show him wearing a headset, but he probably has a, a pair of glasses on, right? I think this, this is where we're, we're headed. And unfortunately, uh, because of the technology limitations, a lot of the, my videos got cut out, so I'm trying to, maybe I'll augment a little bit of the video with a little bit more talking. So I apologize if I'm talking too much. Um, so one benefit is that, you know, this new change in our, in our lands is going to allow us to educate a lot of people over the next 50, 60, 70 years. In fact, if you look at this picture from uh, the, the, the UN, essentially, uh, they're saying that we're going from a minority of people who have college degrees and graduate degrees today to by the end of the century, essentially most people in the world will have a college degree or a graduate degree, right? How are we gonna educate that many people? I think we, we definitely need new ways of doing it, different than what we are doing today because our system today only allows a very select group of people to get that level of education. And it's not really fair, it's not fair to all the people who were born in the wrong country or born to the wrong parents or born, born you know, with, with the, the wrong caste, right? I think that's, that's something that, that VR will allow us to essentially equalize and allow everybody to be fully educated and release their potential. And, you know, I come from an Asian background, so we really care about education, but this data actually helps to kind of dollarize what education really means. Uh, if you see this picture, essentially it shows very clearly that depending on how much educa education you have, there's a direct correlation to how much income you will make as an adult. Right. Uh, I don't really think that's necessarily fair and it's you know, definitely not necessarily going to be evenly distributed, even though you, no matter how hard you work, if you're not in the right place, you weren't born in the right place, you won't be able to get that education. So, you know, I think this is, this is one of the reasons why I think we need to start thinking about how to democratize education using technology, and we have the tools at our hands to do that. So something that's also very sad for me is when I saw this data, I, I was very disturbed. And for the people who actually are going to high school and going to college and graduating, a third of high school graduates never read another book after they graduate. 42% of college graduates never read another book after they graduate. This is according to New the New Yorker. Uh, anyway, in this U.S. data, it may be different for different parts of the world. Um, but that's, that's a little sad. I mean, that almost tells me that 
our current system is broken because if we have already selected the best people in the world, the smartest people, the most, you know, uh, the ones who pass all these tests and they still don't utilize the education that they're given, this opportunity that they're given, you know, something's wrong with what we're teaching. So if you look at the current education system, you know, essentially it's based on a model that's been around for a few hundred years and originally designed to teach people how to make products in a standardized way. That's why all the classrooms are in squares and rows and in columns. And that's why we have bells that, you know, signal every period, just like they do in the factories, right? And the blackboard here, this was invented 200 years ago. If you look at classrooms today, really, fundamentally, it hasn't changed. The teacher in the front with a, you know, erasable marker instead of, a, instead of chalk, and it's a whiteboard instead of a blackboard. That, that has not changed, even in the best schools in the world, right? And something's wrong with that. When we think of a school, it's a physical place. It's all about, you know, grading people, having people put into different grades. This is also, think about manufacturing. We had grade A, B for triple A grade B. This is the same issue that, you know, the way, the men mentality that we have of, of separating our students. We have a fixed, all the students, which doesn't make sense when every single student has different needs and different learning periods, learning speeds. We use problem sets to teach them so that they all have a single set of mindset. We reward just hard work. Essentially, you don't have to be super smart and creative. You just have to finish your problem sets, turn them in on time, and take your tests of what you've been asked to remember, and you memorize them, and you regurgitate them. Right? That's not really education. That's teaching people how to take tests. And we reward people by their tests, right? I mean, you don't get to go to a good college if you don't do well in standardized tests. And standardized tests does not really represent a person's creativity or their, or their uh, intelligence. And it's all about individual results. It's everybody for themselves, right? If I get a good grade, I do well. I get ranked in top five, a top 10, top 1% of my class, and I get to go to a better college, right? That's not necessarily the type of attitude we want to teach our children. And it's teacher directed, right? Teachers are there to tell the students what to learn, when to learn, how to learn, and what's right and wrong. I, honestly, pretty much every aspect of what today's school is today, I have issues with. I would much rather see us get to a school where it's about experience. Every class is an experience. You go and you go do something. You see something. You travel back in time. You travel into space. You become the size of an atom to understand an atom, right? You are taught to be learning what you're motivated by so that you, you open the intrinsic curiosity of the, of the students and let them be self-motivated and self-driven versus being put on to essentially a, a curriculum that is, you know, 50, 100 years ago that really hasn't changed much. Everybody can be having a personalized education curriculum based on your learning speed, not just to the, the minimum uh, standard of that class. You know, where the creative and, and maybe outperforming kids actually get really bored. And a lot of times they underperform because of that. And what we also learned is that having project-driven learning is a lot more valuable and a lot more meaningful than assignment-driven learning, where, where they're actually given a problem and solving it. And then using their creativity and breeding curiosity, that's really what we need to do because that's the skill set that separates from everything else is that we want to solve problems. We have an innate drive to learn. We actually, as, as an animal, we are built to learn. We have like a natural instinct to try to learn things. Even as a baby, we want to learn as much as we can. And we're, 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 our education system is actually is this restraining that learning by making it born. And we really think about how to get people to work together and collaborate, right? Doing team projects. I think a lot of college schools, B schools are starting to, to, to really have more case-driven learning. I think that's actually the way to go. If you look at the summit schools that's been coming out, those schools are also very 
project-driven learning. I think that that's a different mindset that we need to think about and, and, and try to apply to our existing education systems. And then, you know, later on, even in our virtual classrooms, we can use similar learning models. And, and teachers should see themselves not as somebody that directs the students, but somebody that coaches the students. If we see every child as our own child, we don't just tell them, okay, one plus one equals two, just know it and that's it. We should be saying, well, how would you do it? What do you think about that? You know, how, how would you go about solving this problem and really coaching the students to, to, to get to a solution? You know, VR, AR, XR, it's, it is the best tool for getting information from a book or concept into the brain. Right. I don't think anybody here, and I think most people are in education, if they know about the technology, you will agree to that. We just haven't really found a good way for people to adapt, adopt it yet. Um, and hopefully, you know, the our efforts of all of you in this room and the ones that are going to be uh, in this industry will help make that happen. Uh, this was a video of this child looking at a uh, I'm explaining uh, things about physics, but I think you can get this concept. This is how kids are going to learn. And this is, and they don't have to go into a classroom. They can be taught by the smartest people in the world, the most complex concepts, and shown in a way that is easy, easily graspable by anybody. And that's already happening today, right? Uh, you know, these are, these are real classrooms that are in China today that uh, have, you know, we've been involved in, in helping uh, set up over the last couple of years. The one on the bottom left there, that one took us a week uh, to set up with three of our engineers there to, to get using the old 1.0 lighthouses and live ones to be able to set up 50 students in one, one classroom. The one on the top right is a uh, standalone based on the initial focus about a year ago. That took us 30 minutes to set up a 50-person classroom and done by the teacher, not by engineers. Okay. The one on the right is essentially a, a kindergarten, a VR kindergarten, where people get in and, and learn about space and chemistry and do experiments. In some of the past equipment in the world, they're using a Vipro. Okay. These are real classes that are happening today. So about four years ago, when I first joined, I actually worked with one of the, uh, I guess, a training institute. And, you know, we, we weren't in the real schools yet. So they helped create this research. And I, 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 after seeing it, it gave me so, so much confidence in what we're doing is the right thing. Essentially, what we did was we broke up a class uh, of 40 students into two groups, a VR group and a uh, standard control group, same teacher, same curriculum. The only difference is we supplemented the VR group with VR education in astrophysics. So after the course, you can see, and they broke up the students into the high performers, medium performers, and the low performers based on the pre-testing that were done and evenly uh, uh, you know, uh, numbered across all the three sections with the two groups. As you can see, the worst performing student in the VR group outperformed the best performing student in the control group, right? What that tells me is not necessarily just that VR works well and teaches everybody. What it actually also tells me is that every single child has the potential to be a genius, to be the potential to be the top of the class. We just been using the wrong tools to teach them because we haven't motivated them. We haven't excited them. We haven't enticed their curiosity to come out. We haven't explained it in a way that works with their mind's conceptualization. Right? But once you do, every child outperforms the top performer of the normal class. Now, you know, a year after that, we, we worked on another study where we started to take into account uh, brain signals. So the first one, we just essentially evaluated them based on test results. Now we looked at, you know, how how is their brain working? How much is it is it activated during this class? And this was doing a um, a beginner physics class. And what we what you can see is that there's there's two there's two lines. The top 
uh, the top blue line is the VR class. The bottom blue line is a standard class. And we put on the EEG sensors on them throughout the entire class. And as you can see, essentially, in the VR class, they are highly interested and motivated. And the brain is moving, activated the entire time. Whereas what you see with the, with the uh, regular control class, their brain waves fluctuate at all times below the VR class. And then sometimes towards the end, they got really tired. They just got bored and they started to think about other things, birds outside the window, et cetera. Right? So they didn't learn as much. And their results showed. The, the average grade on the VR class, A. Average grade on the control class, a B minus, right? A week later, a week later, we tested them again. And the children in the VR class outperformed the immediate results of the, the control class. Right? So not only is it helping them do better immediately, it's helping them retain what was taught. So this is something that I think a lot of people talk about, right? Creativity. That's the, the secret to the human success is our ability to create. That's what separates us from the artificial intelligence systems out there. Can VR make you more creative? Right? That was, I actually gave my, my team this question and we were able to work with you know, one of the, the universities uh, in, in Beijing to go through this study. And this, this is something that just came out last month. This is brand new data. We've never presented it anywhere else. So you guys are very lucky. You're the first people in the world to see this data. But it's, it's again, super encouraging. What it's showing is that the, the activation of the stimulus of the brain based on the, the power spectral density of the EEG is significantly higher for the VR group. And after doing this, this uh, exercise, we use the, the, the Wilson Creativity Test, right? which is a standard test that's accepted across the industry of how you measure creativity of students. And clearly, you see that the control group is not, is, you know, essentially, the, the VR group is twice improved twice as much in their creativity after the session. And one of the exercises I wanted to share with you a, a specific picture, you know, because numbers are numbers, but pictures tell a thousand words, right? So here's one of the exercises. We gave two circles to uh, students, and we said, you know, draw from it. Make something cool from it. One was in VR and was on paper. The one on the left, we had two circles. The one on the right, we gave them two spheres. And this is the pictures that came out from these students. These are eight to 10, 12 year old students in, in Beijing. And it's amazing. You can see the, the, the little creativity that's been put into the, the right side because we've given them an extra dimension. We've given them tools to work with, right? Same kids, these are eight to 12 year old kids. We didn't give them anything else. And this is what they created. learning surface versus when you give them a three-dimensional space and colors and patterns and lights and sprinkles, they get to do different things. And they did this in about the same amount of time. That was what's the other amazing thing. So one of the things that we all want to do is to learn another language. Can VR help you learn another language? The answer is yes. Uh, using the, the English uh, learning uh, IELTS standard, going from six to seven on that standard usually takes about six months. All right, for this, the control group, after that, that two months, they only got about halfway there. What's even more amazing, what's even more amazing though, is how do they feel about it? When we went back and tested them and said, would you use this? Would you use this in the real world? There was a 10X increase 
of people who would use it, use what they learned in the real world after learning in VR. Why? Because when they were learning, they were already talking to somebody. They were talking to a, a virtual you know, AI avatar that was listening to them and giving them in feedback, and they had nothing to be afraid of because they're used to using that language. They got instant feedback on their accuracy, on their pronunciation. Right? One of the things that when we learn, one of the things we're afraid of is, is saying something wrong, particularly the Chinese English learner because they're so tonal um, sensitive. They, they want to pronounce everything perfectly, and they can't pronounce it perfectly, they don't want to say it. And, you know, that's unfortunate. So when they learned it in VR, they were practicing and they didn't have any fear because they knew that that AI avatar wasn't judging them on how well they said it. They, nobody's making fun of them. So they kept using it. And then they start got into the habit of speaking more. Right? I think this is the type of thing that's happening that we need to apply and, and, and have our teachers out there know. You know, can it improve our memory? I think all of us wishes we can we can memorize things more. We did a test specifically on this, and we found essentially a you know about 80 to 90 percent increase in terms of using VR to help you remember things across various spectrums. Can it help you in physical sports or a skills learning? Absolutely. Right. Here's here's a study that we did with the Chinese youth soccer team. These guys are already the elite of the country, right, in terms of, of a, a sports skill. After a month of learning with a VR class versus a standard class, same coaches, you know, all top, top students from top soccer players, youth soccer players from around the country, the improvements on soccer strategy went up 35% for the VR group and only 5% for the non-VR group, right? And this is, this is on a, so you're essentially teaching the top of the class and then they still improve by 35%. And that's amazing. I mean, if you apply this to the average learner, the numbers would be even more impressive. <clears throat> yep. So, you know, as you can see, for the, the results of education is great, but a lot of times I get a, a question, oh, but you, you put a screen next to somebody's eyes that's an inch away, it's gotta be bad for them, right? Um, actually, no, what, what we, and then I was actually concerned about this as well. So, uh, so I had my team work with, with uh, these were uh, teach, uh, uh, doctors from the, the op optometrist, op optometrist uh, department of the People's Hospital here. And they actually measure students after an hour of usage of, of VR, right? This is what we found. The, the difference of using VR versus the difference of people using tablets, right? I think all of us as both parents and teachers and you know, educators, we don't mind people using tablets. We don't mind people reading books, but we have, there's a lot of people who are concerned about people using VR. What we found is that using a tablet essentially you are you know, fatiguing the eyes or changing the, uh, the myopia of the eye uh, as much uh, using a tablet as you are using a VR device. In fact, what we found was that uh, it's a little bit slightly better. The performance of the VR devices outperformed the tablet and, and much outperformed. It was actually twice as good as a phone. So we also did this same test with a phone. I, don't have, I, I didn't include that data, but it was... <clears throat> The, the eye fatigue when using a phone was twice as much as using a, a VR device. And we went back and I to understand. And one of the, the main reasons was the focal length of VR device is about two meters from you. It's a much more natural viewing distance. Whereas when people are looking at their phone, it's probably about two feet from you. So you're straining your eye constantly to, to read from a small surface, right? Same for a tablet. So, you know, again, and, and I think if we went back and did this test for, for books, we'll have the same exact issue. Why is it that 90% of Chinese children uh, have to wear glasses? Because they read too many books, right? Same, same issue. So at least I want you to understand, uh, you know, it's not as, uh, the, the concerns are not as much as people might expect if we are okay with them using 
uh, tablets or phone or books, and we should be comfortable letting them use VR. Again, this also is, is with the, the uh, caveat that it has to be devices that fit the child, right? Uh, what we did find is that if the child's head, their IPD does match the, the IPD of the device, if their head is too small, they will not uh, get very good results because they, they, they see it clearly. If they cannot see, they cannot, you know, they will not have a good experience. So it's important that uh, whatever device you guys are using that has to fit the, the, the weight, size, IPD of the child so that they're comfortable, physically comfortable. Uh, and then once we found that they get past that, then the, the, the optical issues are a lot less of a concern. Uh, even then, we still recommend for young children uh, below eight, probably use short uh, sessions, maybe 15, 20 minutes versus using a very long session. Because right. uh, it, you know, it, it will take the, a little bit longer for for very young children to adapt, whereas for adults, uh, I think we're we're much more comfortable. So, this technology is enabling a new way of teaching. In fact, here's an example that I wanted to share with you that happened just last year in China, where when the 5G networks released, we actually did a shared class of the schools in Beijing doing a video VR class uh, over a 5G network to the poorest part of China in Guizhou. And so having the best students, uh, the most advantaged students in, in the country, being able to share a teacher, share experiences with the poorest and most disadvantaged students in the country. And they were able to share classes and enjoy and having the camaraderie of having made friends across the country. Right. That's the kind of things that our technology is enabling because of things like 5G, because of things like VR, right? And you know, here's here are examples from our specific people who are speaking at this conference today. So uh, Paula Polino on the top right there from her Shenzhen uh, uh, International School, uh, bottom right from uh, the Shan Shannon Putman uh, from the, the Cochrane Elementary School, uh, bottom left, uh, Angelina uh, Dayton, Dayton from uh, the Cherokee Nations. These schools are already applying VR on a large scale, right? Multiple students at the same time using it to enhance the curriculum. And the top left is actually the number one high school in the country, in, 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 in China. Uh, it's called the uh, Zhenda Fuzong. It's a people's university's uh, high school. And it is the most famous high school in China. Everybody applies, essentially a billion people apply it every year to try to get into this school. Well, maybe a hundred million kids try to get into this school. It's, it's crazy. And they only have a few hundred students. And they're using VR to teach their kids because they can see the value, right? So I wanted to, to uh, kind of, here's, here's a statement that I think you guys have all seen. The future is already here. It's just not very evenly distributed. I think William Gibson's line here applies so well to VR education, right? Because you can see here are real classes, real cases of what VR classrooms can be like. And it's very available today, and it's already available in different parts of the world. So a lot of times I get a feedback is, oh, but Education and VR, it's too expensive. We have no budget for that, right? Is it, is it true? Is it real? So I actually went back and, and, and uh, had my team look at the data. What is the average budget of different countries around the world for education on a per student basis, right? So if you look at the, this data, what it shows is that China is about one-tenth the budget, one tenth the budget of the you know Norway and the half uh, one fifth the budget of the United States, and you can see what they are doing already in in education. Why is that not possible for other countries to do this? In fact, if you just want to buy a modern six degrees of freedom headset, five hundred dollars. Why is that not affordable for most countries in the world? In fact, when I went back and looked at, at the, the average spending, pretty much across the board, except for maybe very 
developing nations, they are all as much uh, as, as China or much higher in most of the rest of the world for their per capita uh, education budgets. So my question back is actually, how can we not, how can we afford not to use VIA? That's really the question we should be asking. So, you know, I kind of made a joke of this earlier in, uh, in, the, in the presentation about the coronavirus, right? But it's, it's a real thing, right? And it is something that I think, even though right now it's a very negative impact on global economy, on China, on the people's restriction on travel, but it may actually have a silver lining. What's happening today, essentially, is that 150, 200 million students right now are studying remotely from home, right? And another 250, 200 something million workers are working from home remotely, right? So we essentially have most of the country today doing their normal work and life and study without leaving their home. And they're using digital means to do that. They're using video conferencing, they're using messaging, they're using online drop boxes, assignment uh, um, uh, bulletin board, et cetera. If we had VR for all of these people, it would be so much better right, than what they're doing. But right now, they're already starting to accept it. I can tell you that right now, you know, most offices in China, especially white collar offices, are empty and people are choosing to work at home. Right? That is going to change the mindset that, hey, you can actually be productive without being in the office. I think this may actually create a sea change over time of allowing for more remote work and remote and distance education that will enable the kind of things that we talked about in the beginning of this presentation. So now I wanna go to the, you know, beyond the children's side, right? Because you know, the first part of this presentation is really about how is it applying to children's education. But I think adult education, adult training is actually just as important to our society as children's education. Over the next 10 years, 800 million people's jobs will be displaced by technology. These people will need to be retrained. How are we going to retrain? What means do we have to do that? This is a real issue, right? And this is going to be a increasingly important issue as technology accelerates. These are the numbers from uh, the, the, the World Bank in terms of percentage of the current workforce in these countries that will be displaced over uh, the next 10 years because of education or potential to be replaced. 50% or so in the US and about 70% in China. That's crazy. How are we gonna re-educate people? Not only that, here is the lifespans of people over the next you know, uh, dozens of years. People are living longer because of the things that we talked about in the beginning, because of the genetic technology, medical technology, because of better nutrition, better medicine. People are living longer and they need to be an important part and contributing part of the society longer. How are we gonna retrain them to come back to the workforce? How are we gonna stay relevant in the workforce? Lifelong learning is going to be more and more important and VR is going to be the way to help teach you know, a, a, a lot of people, hundreds of millions of people over the next 10, 20, 30 years. And the things that AI are going to be good at are actually the things that we're not very good at. But the things that we are actually pretty good at are things that are pretty difficult for artificial intelligence today. The things I mentioned earlier. So what should we be doing? We should be encouraging the schools, encouraging our children to focus more on creativity, on really fostering curiosity and helping them communicate. How many 
uh, series or, or uh, Alexis today are having very good conversations with any of you guys, more than taking a single command? Probably not very well. How many of them do you expect to get on the stage like this and be able to talk about a particular topic in a relevant Probably not anytime soon. So we need to get ourselves, our children, our students to focus on these skills, how to collaborate, how do you get people to work together, right? How do you get people to be motivated, how do you coach people? How do you have more compassion for everybody around you? Those are the kind of skills and feelings and, and capabilities that we should be getting our children to focus on. A lot of people are talking about you know, AGI, artificial general intelligence. I really see artificial intelligence as something that supplements us. It should be GIA, general intelligence augmentation. AI should be something that makes us all smarter. AI should be something that a technology that gives us the information that we need so we don't have to memorize everything in, in the Wikipedia, but we have access to it anytime. Right. It should be able to give us the information we need when we have a question. Right. So really what we want, we want to do is to breed the ability to have that curiosity to ask the right questions. So how can we use technology to supplement what we don't do? That's the focus of the AI uh, researchers today versus trying to create a AGI system that essentially replaces the human. It should be something that makes us all super intelligent. Um, you know, I, I, I'm a big fan of Elon. I, I think he's done some amazing things. And, and you know, one of the companies he's working on is actually called Neuralace, uh, Neuralink, which has a product called Neuralace that essentially cuts a hole in your head and, and allows you to insert information and, 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 and uh, sense information from your brain directly. Uh, long term, I think this will actually be one of the important ways that VR evolves into over time, but it's going to be a long time, probably decades. Until that happens, uh, until we get into the matrix, you know, VR is probably the best way, or XR is going to be the best way for us to both take in information and give out information and to retrain people, give new skills, right? Uh, it's hard to, to dial in and say, hey, you know, make me be able to uh, fly a helicopter or give me the skill to play Kung Fu or to, to play Kung Fu like, like in the movies. But in VR, you can almost do that. We've seen essentially across the board, across industries, that new skills that can be learned for adults in various situations without risk, without you know danger, and be able to be very effective. And they remember those skills because those procedural skills are things that you actually are physically doing. And your brain will, it's like riding a bike, right? Why do people say you never forget how to ride a bike? Because it becomes a procedural knowledge. And that's what VR does. It turns whatever information you have into procedural knowledge. So these are just examples. I won't go through all the details. <clears throat> Um, there was a video here of uh, the New York policeman using uh, VR to teach them how to react to a, a crisis situation with terrorists, right? These are kind of things that you really cannot simulate in the real world, but you can do it again and again and again in VR and be able to, to train the, the, the behaviors, the, the, the reflexes that you need to, to survive that type of a situation. Uh, there was another video here, but uh, this is essentially the, the, the flame uh, product, uh, you know, firefighting uh, suit that is heated uh, with a track hose with uh, VR on the headset. So you really have a fully immersive, fully tactile experience across any firefighting scenario, right? So you don't have to worry that the person who goes into that burning building is the first time they've actually seen a fire in a burning building. I mean, that would be pretty scary for a lot of industries. In this case, you can simulate it 100 times in VR and not worry that somebody's going to get hurt. Same with speaking, right? There's a lot of people afraid of getting on stage and speaking. If you have ovation, you can actually use eye tracking and make sure that the speaker is actually looking at every single 
audience member in the eye for the right amount of time with the right inflection, with the right hand movement, with the right amount of foot walking around the stage to induce people's attention. That's the kind of things that VR can do, right? Whether you're a white collar worker, a blue collar worker, a security person, there are tools out there to help retrain you to be a better professional. If you're a doctor, would you want your child to be the first person that's operated by this doctor? Probably not. In this case, you know, there was, uh, I think, the, the, the Royal uh, uh, School of London, I think, uh, Royal College of London, uh, Imperial College of London did a study and it showed that using VR to teach surgery procedures, they were able to finish a procedure without assistance 83% of the time when they did it with a VR class with people who only learn with books and with cadavers, they couldn't. They actually had to have 0% of those uh, students, those medical students finish the procedure with assistance from the teacher. How about driving, right? Don't we wish uh, there was everybody else was a better driver. I think we're all perfect drivers, but we all wish everybody else was better driving. Well, um, according to our friends at the, uh, the, the, what is it, um, the Eastern Pioneer Driving School in Beijing, the number, the largest driving school in the world, they graduate 200,000 driving students a year. They use VR to train their students to make sure that they are ready for any scenario, whether it's rain or night, snow or an emergency stop by the car in front of you or a dog jump jumping in front of you. These are scenarios that you cannot simulate in a real car with a student. But in VR, you can, and you can do it again and again, and there's no danger. So what, what they found is that when you train in VR, 90% of these students are able to pass a physical, real driving test at the end of the course. Without using VR, only 50% of them passed this driving course, the official city driving test. Right? I mean, this is amazing data, real data, and it also helps them reduce their costs. I was talking to the, the GM there and he said, yeah, normally we have one teacher to one student when they go on these driving uh, experiences and, and lessons. But now we can have five students to one teacher when they have simulators because the, the students don't have, they're not in danger. So we're not worried about them making mistakes. In fact, we want to see their mistakes so that we can then go back and look at the, the, the recording of the, of the session and give them tips. Right? That actually reduces costs reduces wear and tear on the physical cars that they used to teach, and it improves the results. And these students can come in any time of the day to do these simulations. So there, I'll show you this video at the end. <clears throat> so I guess I just really want us to start changing our mindset. I want us to think a higher level, right? Um, we're now getting into, well, I guess, Today, we, we've been trained over the last, you know, dozens of years of our life that the world has scarcity. So we have a limited amount of everything, right? Time is limited. Where you are, the location is super important. You know, everybody's trying to make as much money as they can so they can, you know, take, have a good place to live and send their kids to college. You know, we really want to show how smart we are and, you know, how the IQ is really the key to, to our success and having the answers to everybody's questions is really the key to to why we are important. And having the credentials, having the titles, and getting the status, right? That's what everybody strives for in today's society. But I think that's something that needs to change. Over the next 10, 20, 30 years, we are going to be getting to a new world. We're, the world that we are going to live in is going to be very different than the world that our parents lived in. Then the world can consume. Uh, we just probably need to make sure that you know they don't get lost in, or damaged in, in transport, you know, or wasted. Uh, 
because of our ability to to work in different places, we're going to be having a lot more flexibility in time. We, you know, I spent 60, 70 percent of my time in the past traveling. This last month, I've actually not done any business travel. I feel like I have so much time in my hands. It's amazing how much more time you have. I've been reading so many books, more exercise. I mean, it's when you take that travel out of your lifestyle, it changes your your perception of time. Location is no longer important. You know, as we showing today, all of us are in different parts of the world and different places, but we feel like we're in the same place. I'm seeing you guys eye to eye, and I feel like you are here, right? We can have that with the, the technology that's coming up. And how much money is important anymore? Because if we don't have to buy all these, you know, physical nice cars and, and big houses, and we can live anywhere we want. In fact, you know, we can have a big house in, a, in, in some island somewhere and it costs a lot less than a small apartment in a big city, right? How are we gonna be judged? Is it by how smart we are or how imaginative we are, how creative we are, right? That's really what we need to be judged by and what we will be judged by. And what questions we give, not what answers that we, we get to, right? Because the computers will give us the answers. I'm not worried about finding answers. I'm not worried about memorizing what different, you know, weights or formulas are. All of that is stored somewhere else. And how to use that information, the wisdom, that's really what's key, right? What's defined as wisdom is taking knowledge and then knowing what to do with it. That's something that we can do that right now and probably for the foreseeable next 10, 20 years, artificial intelligence cannot do very well. And what should be driving us to become you know, a CEO of something, to have a great title? No, it's really what's internally driven me for the last 30, 40 years is that internal purpose that my dad gave me when I was eight. That's the kind of thing we need to make sure that every person that we are involved with, our, our students, our children, ourselves have purpose. Once we have purpose, actually everything else becomes a lot clearer. How we spend your time becomes a lot clearer. So inspiring purpose is I, I wanted to, to actually show one example, a uh, very personal example. So um, these are pictures of my children, my two daughters. Uh, this one, the top left, and then the, the one on the, the little bit on the right, on, on the left, of um, Warren Buffett. Those two girls are my daughters and I've been trying to inspire them and trying to give them purpose. So the first time I met Warren Buffett was when they won the Warren Buffett business plan competition uh, five and a half years ago, beating out 4,000 teams around the country uh, in the US to, to win that contest. And they came up with their own idea. They wrote their own business plan. They wrote their own PowerPoint. The only thing I was involved with was reviewing their final pitch because they didn't want me involved because they didn't want me to disturb their thinking. That's the kind of mindset we need to have. You know, and the, the bottom two, or the, the bottom two pictures are the robotics team that they're involved with. The, my daughter is the, the CEO of her high school robotics team that she just graduated last year. They were number two in the, in the world last year. Uh, beat out 6,000 teams from around the world in the FRC class uh, in first robotics. Uh, and my daughter on the, uh, on the uh, side here, uh, my younger daughter, uh, is in the FTC class of uh, first robotics. Uh, 6,000 teams around the world. They were number one in the world uh, two years ago, and last year was top 10 in the world. So they, what do they do? They, they're given a problem. They're saying, here's a problem go make a robot, go program it, go optimize it, go find the, 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 the software you need to, to make that all happen. Make it autonomous in one section, make it manually driven in another section, and then compete. And then also go out and find teams that you can cooperate with so that every competition, every competition you find people that are part of your alliance that you work as a team to go and compete with other people. You have to sell yourself of why other people should pick you. You have to optimize yourself. You have to go and do community activities to, to be able to inspire people. This is the kind of project that I think teaches our children 
how to think, how to, how to learn for themselves, and how to work together as a team. Right. This is the kind of stuff that really got me excited. And my daughter on the right, uh, she was one uh, I guess the only person in our state that received a DECA scholarship to go to the university. Now, that's something that I'm, I'm very proud of. And, and you know, why, why did, were they so motivated? I wanted to give you a um, little picture. So she was cleaning out her room to go to, to, go to the dorms. And I, at the bottom right of her, if you see the bottom right of her sheet, uh, of, of her of her little board with there's a piece of paper or two pieces of paper and I'll show you what it is so this uh, a list I gave them when they uh, one was eight and the other was five and I said hey girls you know I want you guys to have a list of tips that I think are important for you to be better humans to perform well in your world in your life and I want you to read this. And I know that you do not understand these things. It's it's a very long list, 80 items, you know, everything from you know what to do with your life, you know, how to take care of your health, how to work together, how to learn, how to have relationships, how to set purpose. And I gave it to him and I said, just read it. I know you won't appreciate it. We can walk, walk through it and talk through it once a month and see if you have any questions about it. And they actually printed it out and they put it on their little corkboard. Both of them have their little corkboards and they put it out and they left it there. And they kept doing it. And they kept coming back to me after a month or two and they say, oh, what is this about? I don't understand that. Why is this important? And the more we talked about it, we started having conversations. They started to teach themselves. They started to learn the importance of those items. And they came back to me and said, ah, now I understand. Okay, so last year, my daughter, after doing being the CEO of her 100-person robotics team, she came to me and said, now I know what you mean. You can't get you know, the marketing VP and the engineering VP. They don't talk to each other. They're fighting, and our, our board members are not listening. And you know, now she's like, oh, I understand what you were talking about. I understand all those phone calls that you were, I listened to, I heard you have. Now I know what they mean. Right? So this is the kind of thing that at least I did for my kids. Uh, I'm sure you guys all will have your own tools, but I, I think it's, we don't want to underestimate them. I, I, I almost thought, oh, this is probably too much information for them. But looking back, I think giving them more information in the beginning and letting them choose what's important. I think that's actually something that we should give our kids credit uh, for. So how will you prepare your children for the world of abundance? I wanted to give you guys a, um, I wanted to give you guys a little homework. Right? You're all educators, so I think it's important that we all read. Last year, I was very lucky that I, I uh, read, I think, 98 books uh, according to uh, my my online tracking system. But I wanted to to share this data with you. Ah, it didn't display exactly right. We're we're missing the left one. But there's there's four books that I would like you all, if you have time, to read. One is called Prepared, and it's really about uh, a new uh, pedagogy of how to teach through projects, right? And how to how to motivate kids from the, the core. The end of college is really about next generation distance learning and digital education. Uh, how we learn is uh, written by a, a neuroscientist about the biology, the science of how our brain takes in information. And then lastly, uh, the fourth age is really about AI and technology and how machine is learning and how we need to adapt to that type of an environment. Oops. Ah, there you go. So uh, you know, do try to put this on your book list. And for those people who are, you know, we're all high performers and we know high performers all want one thing, they want extra credit. So here's some extra credit for you guys. If you do have time, read the new book from uh, Peter Diamandis. It's called The Future is Faster Than You Think. And I think it's a, it's a great overview of the, the exponential technologies that are coming into uh, our world over the next 10 years and the impact it will have on us. And having a mindset of understanding teaching the future. You know, as educators, we learn a lot. You know, we all learn about history and we say history repeats itself. But I think it's important also that we start teaching a future class. We should actually get all of the kids out there to learn about the future. 
and think about the future. And these are some books that can help them do that because they'll give them a different mindset. I used to be somebody who does not read fiction because I said, fiction, why would you want to read fiction? It's all fake. It's not valuable. But over the last couple of years, I started to read more and more fiction. And I can see fiction, when written well, is actually a class about the future, particularly science fiction. So I've given you a few examples. Uh, Ready Player One for anybody in VR, I'm sure you guys already read this. But that Diamond Age is a Neil Stevenson book about educating using a lifelong agent that is an AI that helps track and monitor you and continually changes its teaching based on your needs. Lastly, uh, Ian M. Banks, uh, his whole culture series, I highly recommend it. And it's really about the symbiosis, a future world where AI is everywhere. And how does that, and, and we are in a world of complete abundance. How does that change how we work? How does the symbiosis of machines and man come together? Uh, it's really useful to actually work through some of these exercises and think about what that future is going to look like. And then prepare ourselves to get there and start doing some of the things to get us there. So um, I think that's all I have for today. But, uh, you know, I think I probably dragged on more than I, I should have. Thanks, everybody, for your attention.